Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. It is Interview Wednesdays. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin. We've got a great show for you today. we got Dr. Dave Ebert on the program. Uh, it's the first time I met Dr. David Ebert. Uh, Dave's a great guy. I met him actually through another shark biologist uh, named David Schiffman, a.k.a. Why Sharks Matter. Uh, he uh, introduced me because I was looking for information on basking sharks and their endangered species listing. Uh, but we got on, you know, when he, when when I started talking to Dave through email and introducing, saying, hey, would you like to be on the program? Dave was really adamant about what he does, what his first passion is, and that is finding new species of sharks. So we got into a lot of cool stuff, guys. It's a lot of cool stuff. And I think it's uh, it's really great to, to see. Not only did he give... Uh, did he give sort of a, a peek into what he does for a living and and sort of the challenges and the successes that he's had, but he also uh, dropped some knowledge on how to you know get a career going in, in this day and age from his experience, uh, which I think was fantastic. He's just I think this is one of those conversations where I could have gone on and both of us could have gone on forever. And in fact, after we hit the the stop record button, we did go on for quite a bit longer, and it felt like it was like five minutes had gone by. Uh, but an hour later, we were like, whoa, okay, we got to get back to work here. Uh, so uh, you'll hear more from Dave, uh, of course, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that, we're, you know, we are, uh, we just, we, I just love the people I get to meet on this show. That's really what I want to try and say is uh, I've, I'm very blessed to be in a position where I get to talk to so many different biologists all across the world and who have done work all across the world. And, and Dave is, is definitely somebody, you know, where he's got sort of that ultimate job where you're just like, this is the job that I pictured when I you know, when I was, when I was in high school, when I wanted to be a marine biologist, when I was a kid, this is when I, what I pictured. A lot of people picture that traveling across the world, you know, looking for sharks or looking for new species, identifying them, being able to name them after whoever we want or whatever we wanted following protocols, of course. But, um, it's just been, uh, it was a fantastic conversation. I can't wait for you guys to hear it, but of course it is the beginning of this conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts in our Facebook uh, group. It's our, fa- our speak up for blue podcast community facebook group a lot to say i know uh but you can get access to that by going to speakupforblue.com forward slash group use your facebook profile request to join i'll let you in we're over 200 members now and we're going strong i think we're at about 205 as of this recording and i'm, I'm looking forward to it. it's great because people are interacting it's awesome people are interacting people are posting stuff um, and if you are already in the group and you haven't posted something yet, I encourage you to post because this is why you join the group. You enjoy you you join the group to get involved in the conversation. And I, what I don't want people to feel is that there are, you know the people that are posting on a regular basis are just dominating because they want to hear from you too. Uh, it's it's we want people, everybody in the in all two hundred and five people to have a say and to request information. We just had Kyle Massey who's been on this on this podcast before. He's in the group. And he requested that I, I return to doing some uh, Research Thursday episodes where I go through a research paper and describe it and talk about some of the new research that's, that have, that's come out uh, in today's, uh, in, in, in today's um, world, I guess, or in today's society. So we're going to talk all, you know, we're going to get that back again because people are requesting it. So it's going to be a great, great time. All you have to do is go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group. Don't be shy. Just use your Facebook uh, account. Request to join. I'll let you in as soon as I see it, and we're gonna have a great time in there. I guarantee it. Uh, the the idea is inclusiveness. The idea is sharing stories. Um, share a story that's important to you. That's that's about the ocean. I find the more we share our stories, the better we do. And in fact, one of the cool things that that I, I in the last podcast on Monday, I said, hey, you know, if anybody's a recreational fisher, please let us know if if all these. Um, you know, shark abuse things and, and fish abuse things happens on a regular basis because it seems like it is because once this, that one story of that shark dragon popped up, there were more and more videos. And Ryan Dubay, who has been a, a, almost one of the beginning members of this group, uh, replied with a big long post to explain that, no, this is disgusting. And all the fish boards say it was disgusting and uh, what the act was. And, and we would never do this. We have a respect in this and there's a code. Uh, and we, you know, we will be the first ones to say something when we see something wrong. And I just think it's fantastic to get that perspective from a recreational fisher because I'm not a recreational fisher. I'm a scientist. I'm a conservationist, but I can't do all of it. Right. And I so you de- you depend and you rely on other people who have their eyes out there 
to give you what's happening. And I think that's really important. So Ryan Dubay, thank you very much for doing that. Really appreciate it if you're listening to this. Uh, but anyway, that's, so just go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group. Join the group. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I look forward to seeing you. When you get in there, introduce yourself. Tell me your favorite species. I'd love to hear from that. All right. Uh, let's start the show. How's about that, right? Let's start the show. If you are sick of hearing of the doom and gloom of the ocean and not knowing what to do, you're in the right place. If you want to meet people working to protect the ocean, then you are in the right place. If you want to find out how you can get involved in protecting the ocean, then you are in the right place. This is the Speak Up For Blue podcast, and I am here to empower you to live for a better ocean. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Speak Up For Blue podcast. I am your host, Andrew Lewin, founder of SpeakUpForBlue.com, marine ecologist, and self-proclaimed ocean preneur. We got a great show for you guys today. It's Interview Wednesdays. We're going to talk all about sharks. I know, I know, Shark Week just passed, and I missed out on a lot of stuff that I usually do. The last two years in the podcast, I've tried to do something special, like do a live talk. Nate, last year, I think Nathan and I did a couple of live episodes going over the programs and stuff, but I didn't really get to watch... A lot of the programs because uh, actually I don't think I watched any. I just I saw some clips and whatnot. Just because I I don't have cable anymore. <laughs> I'm a Netflix guy now. So uh, and an Amazon Prime guy. So I didn't really get access to the Discovery Channel this year. So I didn't really get to watch it. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to talk about sharks. And uh, you know, in a conversation from the group that I just talked about in the pre-intro, um, I want to know more about basking sharks. So I I kind of reached out to to Dave Schiffman, who's a really good friend of the podcast, good friend of mine, great colleague. And he said, you know, if you want to know about basking sharks or any kind of shark, uh, especially on the West Coast, you want to talk to Dave, Dave Ebert. And uh, he's great. He's at Moss Landing a Research Institute, and he's the director there. Um, and he was. He was fantastic. Uh, you know, sometimes it's so nice when you meet people who are doing great things and who are doing things that they really love and they have a passion for there's, you know, it's, it's not often, you know, when you, when you, people say that they want to be a marine biologist or they want to be in marine conservation or they want to save sharks or, or dolphins or whatever, they don't always pull through because life happens or, you know, you get, when you go to university, you get interested in something else or you do graduate work because, you know, that was available to you. And so you decide to go down a different path and, and whatnot. Um, but but Dave was set. He knew exactly what he wanted almost from the age 10. And he followed that. And now he spends some of his time following his passion and discovering new shark species. Now I know. You're probably like, well, hold on a second. How many more new species can we find? Well, the deep sea is very deep. And it's big. Uh, and it's dark. And we looks like, according to what Dave is saying in this interview, we don't know a lot of the species. Um, I think he said he he from my memory, if I if I remember correctly, he said he just he's described or been part of the description of forty new species of shark, and he's got about thirty in his docket to try and get that going. Uh, you know, just full disclosure, it takes a long time to get a new shark described and identified. Uh, there's a lot, there's a big process to make sure that it is a, it's the right species or it hasn't been described before and so forth. It just takes a while. One of them, I think he mentioned, takes about 10 years to, to get described. So that, you know, it's a long process and it's something that he has to follow through and it takes a lot of, of, of people hours to do. And if he has students to help him out, then that's great. But if he doesn't, it's got to wait. And I know, I know it probably bothers him every, every time he looks at that pile of papers and, and those specimens, but you know, he's got the specimens and he's going to probably do it before, before the end of his career for sure. And, and he keeps discovering more species. Uh, one thing that was really cool about Dave is, is he gave a lot of advice, dropped a lot of knowledge on marine careers and marine science and conservation careers and, and what, you know, we need to do if we want to have a full career in ocean conservation uh, and, and science. And I think it's really important when you get people such as Dave who have been, you know, in the, in the field for over 30 years to give us some knowledge you know, and ta he talks about how important networking was for him when he grew up and how it got him his PhD in South Africa. You know, and he talks about following his dream and figuring out how he can actually get to where he wants to go. You know, and, and, and the experiences he's, that he's had because of his personality, his openness to new cultures and his, his willing to, willingness to travel uh, has really brought him all to all the places in the world. And it's, and it's fantastic. 
Um, and now people call him when they see potentially a new species of shark. People actually go see him or contact him or send him a specimen to say, hey, can you can you help us identify this? If we can't, let's help identify, like let's, let's name it a, a new species. So it's just a phenomenal interview, a phenomenal person. And I, I really want to start off by thanking Dave for coming on the podcast. It's, it's really great. Um, when we have people like this, I mean, we're, we're, we've been blessed with a lot of our, with all of our guests really, um, who have just come out and just given everything they have and, and shared their passion. And, you know, after, after you hear these interviews, you know, I feel inspired to do more, right? I get more into it. You know, I want this podcast to come out when I, when, you know, after I do an interview like this, I'll go to somebody and I'm like, yeah, I just did a great interview with one of this guy and he's looking for sharks and he's, he's described new species. Or, you know, when I, when I did the interview with, with Naomi Rose, you know, we, Dr. Naomi Rose, we, we talked about blackfish and we talked about captive orcas in captivity and wild orcas and the comparisons and the whole Kiko story and, or Kiko story. And, and it was just phenomenal. I was telling people before it was published, I'm like, you're going to want to listen to this. This is the episode, you know, and it's just, I, I feel like that with every guest and I feel it more and more with every guest. And, and that's what drives me to keep doing these podcasts. Um, so, so I want to thank Dave for, for helping me stay motivated in that respect. Um, but before we, uh, before we get to the interview, cause I really want you guys to listen to the interview, just to let you know, this uh, episode is sponsored by Patreon, our Patreon campaign at speakupforblue.com. If you go to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you can contribute to our mission. So Speak Up For Blue is a a media and communications company with a mission. We're a social enterprise. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise awareness for for you to help guide you to live for a better ocean. And that is on a lot of different levels from the awareness we provide in the podcast and the YouTube videos uh, and, and any other sort of medium, social media that we have, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, all those kind of things. Um, and, and we also want to help people get into marine conservation. That includes helping women with their careers by providing advice and getting experience from other people, but also providing our own advice. Uh, plus, uh, you know, we want to help people communicate and, and, and do science communication to help other people be aware. But we also want to help people get involved in citizen science. So we're putting a, a, a group together that is going to help people who want to become citizen scientists because there are a lot of programs out there that make you aware of what kind of programs citizen science programs that you can participate in, but you don't really know all the details. You haven't met the people in the program, and we want to provide that. We want to really allow that communication to flow between sort of the people involved in the programs and the people who want to participate to make sure it's what you want, you know, and make sure it fits your lifestyle and your needs. So that's what we're, we're, we're building here. So the funding we get from that Patreon campaign will go to the citizen scientist group. I don't know what to name it, but I'll tell you what, if you guys help all the patrons who actually contribute on a monthly basis you guys will help name we'll do like a vote or something for a different name and you guys can help name the citizen science project and you can help structure it and i because i really at this point i'm I'm really trying to plan it and i don't really want i don't know how to structure it and there's going to be a a post out uh this week maybe i'll make it a video i'm not sure uh this week all about that so uh go to speakupforblue.com forward slash patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n uh, and contribute to whatever you want. Remember, it is a monthly donation or a monthly contribution, um, and it goes right towards uh, our efforts to build that campaign up. So thank you very much. Let's get to the show. Here is Dr. Dave Ebert from Moss Landing, director of Moss Landing Research Institute. He is going to be talking about all his work, what he's done in the past, what he's doing now, and what he hopes to do in the future. Enjoy it, and I'll talk to you after. Hey, Dave, welcome to the Speaker for Blue podcast. Are you ready to dive in and talk about some motion conservation? Absolutely, Andrew. I'm all set and ready to dive. This is awesome. I love that response. Um, this is great because I know this is a busy time uh, for any kind of shark researcher uh, during the summers, not only because of field work, I'm sure, but Shark Week just ended. Uh, and I'm sure you were bombarded with a lot of questions. Um, you had some some students in some episodes and in the past and now. And so I'm sure this is a busy time uh, for you. So I appreciate you, you coming on the podcast and giving us your time and lending your expertise to us. Uh, no problem. I'm looking forward to it. It's kind of nice to get out and just talk, talk to people and let, do my favorite topic is talk about sharks. That's and uh, <laughs> lost sharks is always my favorite one. So 
Absolutely. Cool. That's what, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about lost sharks and discovering new sharks, deep sea, uh, all in your travels all around the world and, and why you do it, why you focus on that. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about some, um, the IUCN red list, and we're going to talk about some, in, uh, the endangered species act and why some species get on and so forth. Um, so it's going to be great. I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, but before we get into that, let's, let's start talking about you so that people can get to know who you are and, and, and what you do. So, why don't you briefly describe at the beginning what you do, who you are, and what you do? Well, I'm, my name is David Ebert, and I'm the uh, director for the Pacific Shark Research Center at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And Moss Landing Marine Laboratories is a consortium of uh, seven California state universities, and that's where our Pacific Shark Research Center is based at. That's awesome. That, yeah. I'll have to admit, like when when people think when they're younger about being a marine biologist and a marine scientist. You know, there's usually two avenues that they think of. They think of, of marine mammals like dolphins or whales, mm -hmm. and they think about sharks. And it's, it's not an easy field. Both of those fields are not an easy field to specialize in as you get older and go through your schooling and, and whatnot. So it's a very difficult because it's such a small, it feels like it's such a small community. There's lots to, to know, but it feels like it's such a small community. Um, and so many people want to get into sharks, especially at the beginning of their careers. When you first sort of when you were when you were younger and you were thinking you know before university and everything like that did, did you get that bug did you get that i want to be a marine scientist a marine biologist yeah well you know most kids you know i was and i was no different you know I was, when i was about five years old my parents gave me a book on sharks right and i, and I actually still have the book and this right. happens a lot of times it's like you know sharks whales uh dinosaurs you know you kind of go through that phase as a kid of course but most people grow out of it um but you'll find people in my profession we're kind of the, the nerds that never grew out of it and that we still kind of like, as I grew, as I kind of went on to, as I kind of grew up, I like kind of got more fascinated. And from the time I was about 10 years old, I just thought like, you know, I want to, I want to go out and like travel around the world because I'm a bit of an explorer right. and I want to uh, go discover things and sharks, why not go to discover sharks? And uh, I wanted to figure out some way to get people to pay me to do that. So <laughs> I was only 10 years old at the time. I had, I had no plan beyond that, but I just thought, right. okay. And uh, of course, you know, my parents were, you know, thought, oh, that's kind of amusing. He'll grow out of that. Yeah. And, uh, but they were supportive of it. I have to tell, I will have to, it wasn't for my parents being supportive. You know, they said, you know, hey, chase your dreams, go for it. And I did. And uh, so I, and I, so I kind of went along, you know, you kind of go through the phase where it's like, well, you know, like white sharks and I, I I was kind of came up in the era that, you know, I was in high school when the uh, movie Jaws first came out. Right. And, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a cool movie and I, you know, I've grown up here in the Monterey area. You know, I used to do a lot of diving and fishing and that kind of stuff. And of course, white sharks were not any strangers around here because there's of certainly plenty of them around. Uh, so that kind of really was kind of a, a, a an exciting time because shark sharks really got into the public conscious after Jaws. And you hear, I actually wrote a, an article for Southern Fried Science about a yep. year ago. And if people want to go check it out, it's interesting that most people look at the Jaws sort of phenomenon in the negative light. Um, and of course, a lot of people that write, talk about that are people that weren't born yet at the time. I actually was at a good time because besides putting sharks on the radar and suddenly every shark attack became an event, what happened was people actually started saying, well, what about, what's really going on with these sharks out here? Let's, why don't we actually learn something about them? Hmm. And so when I got to college in the late 70s and started graduate school in the early 80s, it was a perfect time because there was, people were actually, you know, uh, funding bodies were interested in actually learning about sharks, learning their ecology, their age and growth, their, um, you know, feeding ecology, the reproductive cycle. And so I kind of caught it a really good time in terms of my own sort of development. Right. And, uh, and again, I started realizing I got to know some people along the way that were just, you know, kind of leading authorities, uh, you know, Dr. Greg Kai here at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, one of my first early mentors. Um, then I eventually learned, I met a, a, another professor, Leonard Capano, uh, who was very informative in my career and really kind of opened me up to the world of like this, this diversity out here, the species that people don't know about. And, uh, so that kind of led me off on this whole journey to, uh, to go out and explore and look for these different lost sharks, as I call them. I have never heard that spin on on Jaws before, and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing what movies can do. 
uh, mm-hmm. both positive and negative, uh, in this case, Jaws, right? Both posi- right. positive and negative. It, it instilled fear into a lot of people, but it also instir- it instilled curiosity in, in scientists and, and funding agencies, I guess, to find out more yeah. about these sharks. Right, literally, yeah. I mean, a lot of, that was when, the, when, when sharks really, prior, prior to the Jaws phenomenon, sh- sharks were always kind of a marginal group of fish. In some ways, I could make the argument it still is, but there are most, most of the studies were more taxonomic based, like, oh, we got a new species here. And there really right. wasn't a lot more than that. There was very few studies had been done from an ecology standpoint. But after JAWS, you can just see it just really exploded. And there's a whole cohort of us now that we all kind of grew up at the same time. And really sort of the first generation of people that really started looking at their ecology and the biology out there. And that really, you can, you can just tie that right back to the JAWS uh, phenomenon. That's amazing. I yeah. love it. I yeah. love, so now when you went through, you know, undergrad and, and graduate school and so forth, um, you still had that plan on, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go around the world and I'm going to discover mm-hmm. sharks. Now, a lot of people <laughs> like my, my, uh, my experience when I went through undergrad, I did a master's. That's where I stopped. Um, you know, I went through graduate school and I was like, okay, so, and then, and a the lifestyle sort of, it, it, it sort of restricts you or you, you get different uh, passions in, in the field as you discover right. more about the field. So for me, it was marine protected areas. I was always mm-hmm. my passion, yeah. my, my research interests. Um, but for you, it was all, it, it just, it, it maintained sharks and you maintain that dream from when you were 10 to say, all right, I want to travel around and I want to discover sharks. Mm-hmm. How did you go about that after your graduate work? How did you, did you get right there at that point? Well, well, I, I initially, when I was finishing up my, uh, my uh, undergraduate degree at Humboldt State in Northern California, I was all, I was all ready to go then. Mm-hmm. And, I, and one of the professors there kind of had a sit down with me and said, you know, you really need to be considered going to graduate school. You know, my, my family's fairly, you know, uh, new in the country and, you know, college was a big thing. And so, you know, going to grad school was like never even heard of it much, you know, so it was kind mm-hmm. of a new thing. Like, okay, I'll go, tr- go pursue a master's. And so I came here to Moss Landing Marine Laboratories and started doing working on sharks. And I worked on uh, seven gill sharks, which was mm-hmm. in a virtually unknown. It was a common species in the bays in San Francisco, Humboldt Bay, but nobody knew anything about this 10 foot shark that's swimming around in the bay out here. So that's kind of was my first introduction to working with one of these sort of uh, lost sharks um, and again a lot of times these lost sharks I refer to them as lost but they're they're, they're in some cases they're kind of common just nobody's ever, ever bothered to look at them and uh, along the way there I, I met uh, uh, a guy who was very uh, uh, was helpful and was really one of my one of the key people in my formative years uh, Dr. Leonard Capano who was up at the Tiburon Marine Center uh, just north of San Francisco and I got to know him during my master's degree, and when I, and at the time he wrote the uh, really the the book that was often referred to, the Sharks of the World, uh, okay. for the Food and Agriculture Organization. This was back in about 1984, and I got to know Leonard pretty well, and I always stop in and chat with him. And and he in, in the mid 80s, about 1985, was had taken a position in South Africa. And kind of an off the cuff comment, I just said, "Well, you need anybody to carry your bags, you know? Give me a give me a holler." <laughs> and you know, it's funny how life goes. But about you know six months after he left, he called me up and he said, "Hey, I have a PhD position here in South Africa. Would you like it?" You know, that that took like a nanosecond to say yeah. <laughs> and so That's you know, awesome. within a year, once I got everything sorted out, had my master's all wrapped up. I was on a plane leaving for South Africa and kind of my dream was in the process of being yeah. fulfilled. Um, going, 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 you know, go, I didn't really have any particular country in mind. I always, you know, you always think like, you know, Australia, Great Barrier Reef or something like that, but right. I was in the right hemisphere, you know, different yeah. continent, but yeah. a- Africa worked and uh, turned out it was a, the, one of the best places to go because outside Australia, Southern Africa is, has one of the most diverse shark faunas in the world. And uh, so I was in the right spot and I was heading to the right place and I yeah. spent four years there and it was just awesome. That's so, a, I mean, that's amazing to, it's just, it just goes to show it never hurts to ask. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just being like, Hey, you want me to carry your bags? Yeah. Okay. Six months later you get the call. Hey, I got a PhD position for you. Yep, Obviously absolutely. he must've known you, uh, you know, to the point where your, your work ethic was good and you were, you know, you were, he knew you would be a good PhD candidate and, and so forth and, and knew about mm-hmm. your travels, but it never hurts to ask, 
you yeah, know, no. it, a little ask where it goes a long way. Right. Now I'd gotten to know him fairly the last sort of two years of my master's there. Just kind of, I would, I would, cause I was up fishing in the Bay in San Francisco all the time and I'd just pop in and talk to him and, you know, it was like having a, you know, it was back before you had things like Kindles and download podcasts. It was like right. having my own little, you know, podcast or a Kindle there to just talk with. And he was just, yeah. we spent hours just talking about stuff. And I learned a lot of, I learned a lot about just, you know, sharks globally. Um, yeah. And when I refer to sharks too, I'm also ref- including the rays and the ghost sharks too. Right. Because they are basically flat sharks and ghost sharks. So it's, so I'm, I'm using the term and I'm using the term sharks in a broader context as gotcha. well. So yeah. anyway, but yeah, it was just one of those crazy things. You just, like I said, you know, I said, Hey, I'll carry your bags. And next thing I know, I'm out, I'm on the, on a plane out of here. And um, you know, I had, it was such a, I had just a, an amazing experience because I, they used to joke when I was living in, in, in Cape Town that about that new Southern Africa better than most of the locals there. Cause I, <laughs> I, 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 I tell people I was on, what was your experience like as well? I was on a four year camping trip. And, uh, cause I, <laughs> I, I literally was spent the time either on a boat at sea Right. Or I would be, I mean, I'd spend months at sea or I'd spend like on some beach just traveling around from basically Mozambique to uh, Namibia and just, just literally camping most of the time. Um, Cause you know, there wasn't, I had to basically go out and find stuff and yeah. I found some amazing things during that experience. I mean, that's, so. you know, the, 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 I, I love that your vision when, you know, when you, from when you were young and then you continue to do it. And then when you go to somewhere like a, a new country, like South Africa, you just explore everything uh, through your PhD, but you, you explore everything. And like you said, you knew more about the country than most people who grew up there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it almost sounds like you're a millennial, you know, you try, <laughs> you know, you have the same tendencies where you're just like, Hey, this is what I want. Now I'm just going to make it happen by, you know, exploring my curiosity, exploring travel and, and doing shark work at the same time, but you did it before millennials were even thought of. (laughs) Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you you think about it, I always tell Spectrum Predicted, I'm talking to millennials, like this is before the internet, you know, know, personal computers were kind of a new thing. Um, There was no, I mean, we would literally, you know, tell a story, we'd go off to Namibia, for example, up on the skeleton coast, you know, we go for two months to sample and I just say, well, if you don't hear from us in about 10 weeks, come look for us. Cause <laughs> there was no, there was no communication. Yeah. You, you might stop in a town and find a, 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 a pay phone, right. which you don't even see, you know, no. they don't even have an idea of pay phone. And if you call, but who are you going to, you know, who is I going to call or something, you know, right. it's just, uh, and so you really were kind of out on your own and uh, you just, go to these, like I said, you just pop into some little village, hang around, ask some of the people what's going on. And yeah, yeah, it was just, so you really were kind of exploring areas, you know, nowadays you got yourself, you go to these same villages and towns and I have been to some of them. Everybody's got their iPhone or cell phone or camera phone or, um, so it's it's kind of amusing to me in a way. Yeah, it's true. Like when I, I have a, like I'm, I'm, I have to admit I'm addicted to my phone and I'm always at like it's it's my go-to like when I'm nervous or I'm like in a new place and I'm like I'm think of something and I want to hit the internet to find something, but when I go away, I have a strict policy uh, of of keeping it in in the place that we're staying or I just use it as a camera. That's the only mm-hmm. reason I have it, and I won't get like a, a plan for the country that I'm going to just so that I don't start you know, getting on my phone and losing out on an extreme opportunity to, you know, get to know a different culture and new country and, and everything like that. So um, I, I work within the boundaries of that. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, to go on from this, so you graduate, so, so you're learning about all these different sharks. Now, when people think of South Africa, the biggest thing that they think of, like the first thing they think of, especially with sharks, they, they talk about great whites. Because mm-hmm. that's what you know, they have a very uh, large population i guess of, of gray whites or it's one of the yeah. known populations of, well, of gray whites aggregation areas but you discovered different sharks right 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 just just to talk on the white shark thing when i was there and, and it was kind of a fascinating time because i was there in the late 80s early 90s so i and i was right there in cape town i my where i was working at the south african museum is right across from the parliament so i was there okay. all through the whole time when, when the transition when mandela oh, got out wow. of stuff and i was actually there and you know, when he, the day got out and I used to see these different people like Desmond Tutu and these other people quite regularly where I was based in Cape town. So in addition to just looking for sharks, there was a broader thing. Yeah. I actually had a whole experience of being a foreigner at that time it was kind of, that's a whole other thing. It was just fascinating watching this sort of transition 
very monumental time in the country at that time in South Africa. Oh, so yeah. that was a whole side thing. But that's crazy. I never even yeah. thought about that. That yeah, too. No, it was yeah. Crazy. yeah, it was yeah. So there's a whole other a whole other uh, aspect of that. I even you know I even tell people sometimes I had I had a little bit of a Forrest Gump type of life because I've actually been to Japan and had dinner with the emperor at the royal palace. What? And seriously. And then I've also <laughs> been, and I've also been like in fishing villages. Nobody's ever heard of talking to locals about how to find these weird lost sharks. Um, and then, wow. so I've, I've just literally, my, I've had a whole interesting life in terms of the people I've, people I've crossed paths with. Um, yeah, I was in, uh, you know, just a quick thing. I was in Sharm el Sheikh in the Red Sea back in the mid nineties and, and they had this ended up, I couldn't figure out what was going on. They had this, a lot of activities going on and they ended up, Bill Clinton ended up showing up with a whole bunch of prime ministers from all these countries, like at the hotel we're at. And I'm like, wow. are you kidding me? Yeah. So, um, so I've had a little bit of, you know, not that I had a chance that had a chance to chat with them at all. There's a lot of security, obviously, of course, Egypt, of course. but it's just kind of interesting. I go to some place, I have no idea what's going on. And these people yeah. show up, I'm talking to local locals there and these some, world leaders show up so it's uh I, mean, anyway, I just had a few interesting active events in my life i've sort of crossed paths with and i always think about that movie forrest gump like yeah that <laughs> yeah. happened to me of like just random events that happen but but it's it's yeah. also it's the opportunities that you've afforded yourself by right. traveling to these places and going perhaps out of your comfort zone and exploring new places and mm-hmm. talking to do to new people and and this right is what happens right right, this, this right. Is, yeah. yeah and then you know just coming back to the white sharks in South Africa when I was there, white sharks are pretty well known there. And it was pretty well known that you could go to certain places out to Seal Island and places, and you could see these sharks breach. Right. And I can remember coming back here to California, like just to visit family and friends and saying, God, you know, you're, you're not going to believe this, but these big sharks, like they, they come like rockets out of the water and breach when they're attacking seals. And these guys just thought I was like, like whacked out on something. I was <laughs> drunk or on drugs. I go, no, no, these guys are. And about two or three years after I left South Africa, uh, this fella down there started filming this stuff. Right. And uh, I think it was Chris Fallows. And, and suddenly he became world renowned for filming this. I'm thinking like, well, yeah, this was pretty common knowledge. Just nobody, I'd never thought about like, well, you know, go, let's go film this thing. Right. Um, but you really need to, to film that it's, when you see it live, it's a pretty quick event. It's it's yeah. like your eye, the first time you see it, you're like, did I really see that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not something you can just normally take with a normal camera. You need a bit of high, you have to have some high speed equipment and stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, it was fairly common knowledge around there before it became now internationally known. And everybody likes to go there, all the different media and film the white sharks breaching. But right. you know, there's other place in the world you can go and see them do the same thing. Do they do them uh, in California as well? Yeah, off the Farallons, they've been seen to breach out there as well um, that I know of. And, I, and I've heard people comment on it other places, uh, New Zealand and I believe Australia and a few other places. They just, you know, it's, it's just something that Part of people, the... st- people started looking for now. Whereas yeah. before, it's one of those things people may have seen, but they just didn't register what it was or without having camera or photo evidence, you're kind of like, I mean, look, I mean, I lived it where I'd be telling people like, hey, these sharks actually come out of the water and and knowledgeable people that I you know, respect thought I was crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, I know um, for sure. It's, it's, it's interesting when that, when that happens eh? and you say, you see this behavior and then you go back to your colleagues and you're just, and they're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. This, this doesn't happen. Like this mm-hmm. is impossible. Right. And then you're like, no, right. no, it actually happens. And then a couple of years later you're vindicated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's always, it's always, it's always good to, to feel vindicated. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you don't always feel that way, but there are those times you're like, yeah, I yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> you just almost you just want to just be like I, like wear a t-shirt just saying I told you so in the yeah jumping out of the water with the not, steel. Now that I want to rub it in anybody's face, but yeah, no. I, I knew that. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> but I mean, it's 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 kind of an interesting uh, fact. I mean, it it goes to show like how communication really, you know, in today's world really helps. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether it be you know Discovery Shark Week or social media, where people are taking videos of a lot of sort of interesting behaviors of not only sharks but just different animals around the world, and you and we get to see it now. And so mm-hmm. it's not as if you're coming back from a from a, a PhD in South Africa saying, "Hey, I see this behavior," and people don't believe you. It's you know people are like, "Yeah, like this. I actually saw this on Twitter. I saw this on Facebook. Somebody taking this." Yeah, I think it's yeah. Uh, the cameras are readily available now, or more available, and the technology to share it is more available, and that right. makes it a lot easier, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, like nowadays, you know, where it used to be, you had to go 
send something in the mail. It's like, you know, a, a typical day, weekday for me starts out, I'll get up, I'll pull up my internet and I'll have, see what message I got. And I've used, and it's not uncommon for me to have one or more images sent to me from some place in the world. You know, Hey Dave, we saw this really weird shark. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm hoping that they took a decent picture of it. Cause a lot of times it's of course. like the head sticking out of a pile of fish and it's kind of <laughs> dirty and sandy. Goes, hey, we've never seen this before. And I'm like, yeah, well, can you get a better picture of it? And yeah. <laughs> so I try to actually encourage people like how to take a picture so that I can help me in identifying it. But I get, I get pictures literally all over the world. And, and a lot of times there are things, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's this or that. It's not really common there or, but a lot, you know, there are times I'm like, wow, that's something weird. Yeah. Um, it's either a range extension or like, man, can you guys save one of those? I think that might be a new species, mm. you know, at least from looking at the picture. And, um, you know, sometimes they're in a position they can try to save something for me. Sometime um, not. It's just, it really depends where it is. I, I, mean, I think in, the, in back in May, just this past May, I think I identified about four or five new species from Sri Lanka that are now new to the fauna just based on JPEGs uh, images they took at fish markets, some colleagues there. So that's always kind of cool. Well, yeah. I mean, well, it's also like, if you think about, uh, you know, the, the, how this works now is before somebody, you would have to go to these markets in, mm -hmm. in far off places. And now people can send you images from all over the world right? and say, Hey, you know, this is the picture I saw, you know, or, or this is the picture I took can you identify the species or is it a new species? Um, and I think that's amazing. And, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, but I mean, the fact that you get to travel is awesome. So after let's, let's continue on that after your, sure. your PhD, uh, you got, you know, you want to discover, you want to still explore and discover just mm -hmm. different parts of the world other than Africa and over South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. How did it work? Like, did you come back to Moss Landing right away? Well, no, I ended up, uh, <laughs> I ended up coming back. I actually got into doing aquaculture for about 10 years because like, as you find in the field, I tell people this, you know, it's not an easy field. There's no. not a lot of jobs in it. And even with the high profile, like, you know, you got Shark Week and stuff, sharks are still relatively marginalized uh, in, most, in, in most, most places in the world. That, you know, people get excited. The people in the field you'll talk with, they're very excited, very passionate about it. Right. But in the global scale of things, people are not, you know, they, they, you know there's, it all comes back to what's the commercially important species. On the Pacific coast here, it's salmon, you know, or right. tuna or, or ground fish, uh, depending on where you are. And so, they, so sharks are relatively not that still, you know, viewed favorably in a lot of areas. And uh, though that's changing, but I ended up spending about 10 years in aquaculture. I keep, but I kept... I kept my hand in the field where I was still publishing. I was going to conferences. I kept my contacts up and mm -hmm. things kind of came full circle uh, in the early 2000s when they, when the, uh, uh, the uh, U S government funded uh, the national shark research consortium. Okay. And one of the uh, institutes was here at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And my uh, former professor, Greg Kaye hired me to help run the program, That's start awesome. up the program and run it. And that was back in 2001. And uh, so that's kind of was really a lot, even though they've been doing shark research here, that was really my segue back to doing this full time. But a lot of it was perseverance because, you know, life happens with people. Most people, you yeah. know, you get married, you have families, you just, you know, you got to do stuff. You can't be working 12 hour days and going home. Like I'm going to go work on a paper on sharks or something. Yeah. Cause you got kids, spouse or whatever. And so with me, I, you know, not, not being married or having kids. And I just went home. I worked on my shark stuff. I kept up my contacts right. And so I tell people that are coming in the field, like your bet for most people, your best time is going to be your grad school because after grad school, life's going to happen. And 99.9% <laughs> of the people you're going to leave the field because there's yep. just no positions here. And so, so you get, and you, you also have that whole publisher parish type of thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I tell people like, you know, get a couple papers done. It'll help you for the job standpoint, learn yeah. skills. Yeah, I could teach you about sharks, but learn skills. And that's what I tell people listening, you know, yeah, learn skills when you're in grad school, enjoy it. That'll be your yeah. best time because okay, life happens. Um, and, and most people end up having to pursue other things. So. It's true. It's so true. I, that's the one thing I tell, I help people with a lot of the like marine careers and getting into marine conservation. And the first thing I say is, you know, yeah, undergrad gives you the knowledge. Uh, grad gives you the, the, the experience with research and, and so forth. Um, but 
it's the unique skills that, that really bring you into something. If you want to go right. into a field, learn the skills that they use in that field because that's the, that makes the difference. If you yeah. come in with training on whether it be tagging or um, you know, working mm-hmm. with trawls well, or whatever they do, that, that well, helps. Well, even things that people don't think about that I really encourage because you know, at Moss Landing here, you can only go as far as a, a master's. We don't have a PhD program here. Okay. But, so I, but I stress with them is like things people don't even think about as skills is if you, if you can develop where you can speak professionally, peak at a professional conference, you can publish a paper in a scientific journal. You know, employers look at that real favorably, especially coming out of a master's program. Right. And, you know, you know, I've had, you know, my students are you know, pretty awesome because they, on average, they publish about three papers in journals. And it's not like some paper where it's, you know, my name and they're one of five people. I want them to be the first author on it because that's what's going to count. Because then it shows they can, it shows they can execute a scientific project. They can lead it and get it published. Right. And employers want to know, and you can go, and I've had students go completely outside the field. In fact, most end up doing that. For jobs, but whatever field you go into, the fact that you can actually publish mm-hmm. issues, the fact that you can you, you learn speaking skills. This is all the stuff I, I train students here to do to speak because, it, and it is a skill. And a lot of times, I think students don't realize that that if you can speak and you can write, that's huge. I mean, I, I, literally, I learned in grad school I couldn't write or speak to save my life when I started, but my professor, you know, Greg Kai, he really taught me like, hey, you need to write. If you're going to stay in the field, you need to write. You need to speak. And he says, yeah. if you're going to publish, and you may know this as well, Andrew, but if you're going to publish, you better get a thick skin because you know yeah. you, don't have any, you don't have any friends in the publishing world. No, um, they're they're it's pretty ruthless, and especially when you get your first reviews back, and you're like, holy moly, yeah. it's like you know, <laughs> you, know, so you just true. gotta you literally gotta suck it up and just say, okay, mm. and go back at it. So again, that's why if you know anything about publishing, it, it's a skill. Speaking yeah. is a skill. You get up in front of 200 people and can give a scientific presentation of 15 minutes it's that, that that you know it's coherent it's well thought thought out but well reasoned that's a skill um so you know and then the other thing i always try to work with students is right is, is networking meet people mm-hmm. in the field mm-hmm. and because they can learn that's meeting you know leonard capagna when i was a master's student is what led me to going overseas mm-hmm. and so that's always an important that's and it was also like when you were networking it wasn't as if you just came up and said hey i want to work with you is you no. be, you befriended him you came you you guys interacted a lot you talked about oh, sharks yeah. you shared an interest and that's what eventually got you the phd candidacy right correct yeah it was just it was just it was it was something built over time and i think sometimes particularly with the millennials it's always this more quick a, a shorter gratification time versus building the relationships over right. time right and i mean now i've been in the field you know 35 years almost and I still have relationships I'd built 30 years ago. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, I get a, I get a contact from like a, a media where there's discovery or BBC or national geographic. They want to go do something, you know, it's like, well, they can have some junior, you know, associate or volunteer look around. I know exactly who to talk to, where to yeah. go. Yeah. And so like, that's, that saves them a lot of time for sure um, <clears throat> to, to do this stuff. Cause like, again, and, and, and again, when I go to a lot of these places, I, part of the whole thing is like, I, cause I have these relationships. I don't want to burn these relationships. I mean, these guys, a lot of times are friends of mine and I want to make sure we go in, we do the job. People are coming in. You got to be respectful of what's going on. Yeah. And then, because most of the time I'll be going back there at some point without the cameras and uh, I don't want to, ru- you know, I don't want to, you know, yeah, you don't want to ru- ruin the relationship. Right. right. Yeah. And so that's, that's why I try to stress them. Like, don't think it's all going to happen today or tomorrow. You got to build these over time. Right. And, um, so that's amazing. I, lo- I love yeah. that. I love that advice. I think it's, it's a fantastic advice because it's, it's, it's very similar to what I give to a lot of people who are just coming into the, to the, uh, to the field is if you don't get a job right away, still stay in touch still, right. you know, in fact, I just gave a reference for somebody who had been working with me on speak up for blue for a long time, plus their job. And that was the, that was the, the deal breaker. That was, that was what caused them to get the job was the fact that they stayed engaged with something else beyond uh, their initial job because they were, they, they were passionate and showed that they were right. passionate. That's what they loved about well, it. So it always yeah. helps. But anyway, right. uh, we could probably right. talk about this for another hour, but oh, I want to yeah. get back into sharks. Sure. Uh, and, and your, your, your career at Moss Landing has been uh, vast and amazing. Um, and, and, Thank what you. I want to do is talk about the, the, the Lost Sharks uh, program. Mm-hmm. Um, you've discovered quite a number. How many, how many sharks have you discovered? Uh, I've named about 40 now. 
Um, but I've got, I, I always say that name because I have probably another 30 or more sitting in my lab to, uh, <laughs> that need names for them. And um, people don't realize when you see, when you collect these things, there's the, the fun part going out and finding them. Right. And then there's the actual, the, the more laborious part, which you actually have to write them up and write a right. detailed description. And there's, you know, people don't realize there's actually a, a, a code. It's a International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, a whole process you have to follow right. to, to do it. So it's, it's a little more than just like, hey, that's a new species and just that's it. You have, there's a process. So as I tell, there's the fun part and then there's the more laborious <laughs> part of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, which can be, which, which, you know, can, it's, I tell, I, I kind of equate it to like being like a CSI and that's how I try to present, tell students. It's like you're investigating. It's kind of a crime scene or a shark scene investigation. Right. This is a new species. And, and you look at it in that context, it's kind of fun to go through the process. Is this really a new species? Yeah. Um, cause, cause a lot of times you're not, you're, you think it might be, and you know, at this point haven't been around enough. I usually have a kind of a feel for it, but sometimes you, you don't always know for sure. You got to get back and compare it with other things at, at, at the museums. And, um, you know, one of the stories I tell people to tell students and stuff is, well, the best place to actually find new species are in museums. Right. And, and, um, I just had a, <laughs> interestingly, I had this, uh, uh, just this, uh, the recent alien shark show we, I did, we filmed in Japan. Mm -hmm. The, uh, if I can talk about that for a second, we, uh, had the, uh, Absolutely. Part of the thing we went there to look for look for and tag goblin sharks, uh, but when I was my my uh, Japanese colleague Kazuna Kaya-san, uh, we we actually got like a saw these really really literally lost sharks of some species we rarely are ever seen, and one of the ones we collected I think is probably a new species of a lantern shark. Uh, my one of my students who was out there, Vicky Vasquez, who was in the um, who was actually in this particular program, she uh, named a new species of lantern shark, the ninja lantern shark a couple of years ago, which got quite a bit of notoriety because of how she named it. Yeah. Um, but we collected what I think was another new lantern shark there. And so I came back here, I did just kind of initially went up to the California Academy of Sciences to look at some comparative uh, lantern sharks. And lo and behold, I found a new species of lantern shark from the Philippines. It was in the fish collection that had been collected a few years ago. And that happens more often than people realize. Just, yeah. Just looking around in a, in a museum collection. And uh, so it's kind of cool. That, so I kind of got a twofer in that one. Yeah, on I know. That one. That's amazing. In, in fact, that just reminded me on uh, – so every Friday on our podcast, we do Ocean Talk Friday. where we, uh, My friend Nathan and I, we come on the podcast and we have other guests on. And, and we pick four articles to talk about. Uh, the, the articles that came out that week that we thought would be important to talk about. Last Friday, we actually talked about um, an article that you were mentioned in or you were quoted in. It was out of uh, zmescience.com mm -hmm. and it was all about discovering uh, a new uh, uh, deep sea lantern shark. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. The, this was, this is the, Hawaii, the one from Hawaii? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's ep, ep, I'm going to try and pronounce this. Epmop. Turis Lely? Layla? Layla, Layla, yeah, Edmopterus Layla. Yeah, it's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, um, so we just, we just, and your name came up, and of course we mentioned, I'm like, hey, I'm going to be interviewing this guy tomorrow, so. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was one that was, uh, uh, it, was it was one from Hawaii. That had been collected back in the 1980s, and uh, uh, so my colleagues on there actually uh, were looking at, found these things. Or actually, I think they might have even been involved early on, a couple of them, Brad Weatherby and Steve Kajura, and uh, they were aware of these things. And so they sent, um, they got in contact with me. Well, it was probably 10 years or so ago. And I started investigating it. And uh, one thing led to another. It turned out it was a new species. Um, but it took us about 10 years to actually finally get it officially named. Wow. And, and so, yeah, people go, wow. So, you, so when you say like, well, you've done like, you know, so many, 40 or 50 or whatever. It's like, yeah, it takes a bit. And I have another whatever, 30 or 40 in my yeah. collection. It's like. Yeah, it doesn't happen. You know, the thing is, most of the stuff I'm doing this with is I don't get any support for it. So you're, I'm literally right. doing it as a labor of love on my own time. Um, and, and and with students, it's a lot of times it's just a side, it's a side project for them. But it gives it gives them some writing and speaking skills. For and, sure. Uh, so that's why these things don't happen. It's not like I get paid full time or get paid at right. all to, to work in these. Well, it's, yeah. it sounds like a full-time job too, with the amount of work that goes into each species. Oh yeah, you get them yeah. if they are if they are a new species. 
Right. Yeah. Between the stuff. I mean, just even if you're getting paid full time to work on it, it still takes some time to do, though you could do it. Right. If I could come in and spend 10 hours a day working on them, it'd happen a lot quicker. Right. Um, right. So, but, uh, so sometimes, so that's why when people, you, you tell them it takes them 10 or sometimes 20 years to get something named, it's just because with all the other stuff you have going on, yeah, um, you just Good. can't get to it. Um, so, yeah, um, no, it's amazing. Now let's talk about the collection process because sure. I find that very interesting. Cause if you think about how big the ocean is mm -hmm. and, and you discover these sharks that uh, many of them seem to be deep sea sharks, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like finding a needle in a haystack. You know, it, it, the, the odds of, of finding one seem to be really, you know, really difficult. Yeah. Um, it, it, go ahead. So, I, so I, I know there's like the, you know, you can go like to a country and then you, you'll go to the markets and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot to see if you can identify there. And I, I understand why you do that. But when you go out on the ships to, to do that, are you looking in specific areas based on historical catches from fishermen that what you're talking to take me through that process yeah it, really interesting kind, kind of when you're going out, going out in the field like this is why it works better if you can go to like a fishing village or someplace where you ha might have a hundred boats out fishing because if you're going at, you know if you're if you're doing like on a research ship it's well first of all research ships are real expensive right. and th they're not going to go out looking for sharks for you if you're lucky, they might be doing like a, a bycatch survey and they might catch, they might catch some stuff you're interested in. Um, but, but more times than not, you'll go out like, uh, like some of the stuff one of my, my students is doing in the Indian Ocean. I had the opportunity to some of the fishers I knew. They're working in this uh, remote part of the world. And I basically through the, actually through the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization got in contact, developed this project, and then had a student go out and just like, collect what's out there. I just want to find out what's, what they're getting out there. And he ended up bringing back about eight new species as it turned out. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, you go out there, you have to find ways to go around. You can go out to sea, you know, you spend three months at sea, you might come up with some stuff, um, but then you're kind of on one boat and you're kind of at the mercy of what they're catching. Um, and again, sometimes you go to fish markets, you can kind of get a sense of what they're bringing in because they have 80 or hundred boats out fishing. And then your chances of you seeing more improve a lot. Um, and so you go and then you go to areas of the world. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of the new discoveries are in the deep sea. But sometimes, you know, I just discovered, I just named a new species of guitar fish from uh, South Africa and Mozambique that they catch off the beaches in, you know, north of Durban, yeah. for example. And so this is something, this is something, this is another species I'd been aware of for years, but we finally got it named. Um, uh, actually, it was just formally named about a month ago, and I actually named it after my nephew. So I kind of hoping I'll score some points with him on that one. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I named a shark after my niece a few years ago, so I had to do one after my nephew now. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah but but that one they just catch off. They literally fishermen catch them off the beach. So so even though the deep, the deep seas where we find most of the new stuff these days, you still can find stuff off beaches. Um, and the other thing I point out too is a lot of times. You don't have to go to these remote areas. One of the new ghost shark species we discovered, named a few years ago, was ke ke we catch off California. Uh, it's taken in, in some of the deep sea surveys. And uh, we initially named it, it was from off Southern California and Baja, California. Uh, this thing gets down to like 3,000 feet or more. But now, I've, through the wonderful use of uh, ROVs, remote operated right. vehicles, I, f I see these things occur here in Monterey Bay, which is kind of cool. And here you. You're kind of in techie central here in California and right. I'm still discovering new sharks. Yeah. Unreal. Uh, so, so you don't have to always go. It's nice. I'm not, I love going to some remote out of the way spot, but you can also find them here closer to home for me. Yeah. Which is, which is nice too, because it's like, you know, you go all over the world and you mm -hmm. find all these, these, uh, these new sharks, but then in your own, uh, almost like your own backyard, you're just like, well, hold on a second. There's so many, so many, uh, sharks here that i could discover it's mm -hmm. almost like it's almost like it feels probably like part of your duty you know what i well, mean to be like mm -hmm. well wait hold on these are this is in my backyard i got to do some studies here for if we continue to find sharks there's mm -hmm. gonna be something that's going to be here and what's interesting is 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 uh, i actually posted uh this article that that you sent me on on my facebook page because i thought it was hilarious um it was written by jason biddle and and uh it was i don't know who it was in the video but it, it was uh uh, I guess you guys had a camera down there and it was like three hours of, of footage. And then you see this, I think it was a ghost shark mm -hmm. off the ROV and the expression on the student's face 
when he sees this uh, this shark after you know waiting through you know so many different uh, or so much footage of seeing absolutely nothing, the the expression just goes to show like this is why you do it. You know that's yep. what I posted on Facebook. I'm like this is the this is the reaction of when you see a shark after looking through hours and hours and hours of footage of nothing of just darkness with just the light brought down and then yeah. you see this ghost shark just kind of oh, yeah it's it, it's totally cool we actually when we were doing this uh, recent Discovery Week program uh, the alien sharks uh, thing in Japan we had we put down one of these broofs which are these little drop cameras they put down and we put this thing down about seven eight hundred feet just to see if we could actually maybe get a goblin shark or something on the video. What we ended up getting, though, is we got video footage of uh, this little lantern shark that I think is a new species. So it was kind of cool. We actually caught some of the sharks, and then we actually had some of his buddies on video. So that's almost unheard of to actually get them in the same oh, time yeah. and, and reality like that and see them. And uh, so it's yeah, anyway, so it's pretty cool yeah. to, to, to see that. And then the expression, especially if you get – you got young kids looking at it. The oh, for sure. The expressions are like priceless to see those. Of course, you, my expression is pretty like, wow, we got something really cool. I'm oh, sure. yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I would, I would pretty- imagine. I mean, if you, like, you think about the odds of actually finding something. And like you said, the odds of finding, you know, getting caught, catching them and then seeing them down below, like the like different species that potentially could be new. I, I, I couldn't even, I, I would, tears would come down. I get very emotional if you, if, you know, I was the one discovering that. So, and I don't think you would ever lose that. You know, no. I don't think, I think that's why you do it is because it, that feeling, you know, it's like, yeah. I want to, I want to feel that feeling again of seeing something uh, brand new that nobody else has seen. That I, you know, like I said, I'm kind of, I'm an explorer at heart, but I, I tell you that that's a feeling that it never goes away. I mean, I, I still do this. I still get excited. You know, it literally it's like, it's like having Christmas 365 days a year. <laughs> you know, when you see, when you see something come in and you're like, Oh, wow, I haven't seen that before. Or, you know, it's like, man, that's like, and even this trip we did to Japan, we were seeing things that, you know, some of them were, a lot of them are known species, but things are like, you really never see. There's only one of the, right. one of the sharks we caught. There's only like, there's only like the seventh one we've ever seen in the world that we caught. And of course, you know, like me and my, my uh, Japanese colleague, uh, you know, who's, who's in his seventies now, you know, we, we, you know, we're like two kids running around here. And I got my <laughs> grad students like, going like, Hey, this is like really rare and of course the camera guys discovery go like what are you excited about this thing is well, this is like you know we you know goblin sharks are kind of a dime a dozen you can see those if right. you spend time in the field but this is like a really rare shark <laughs> so it's like it's so um it's just kind of fun actually watching the reaction on their thing because they have no idea why these like middle-aged yeah. guys are running around <laughs> excited about some you know goofy shark i love, um, it. I love it so yeah no, so, well, and, there, so. and there's got to be there's got to be a lot of times where you don't see anything right oh yeah yeah. like misses and 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 zeros you know oh that's yeah that's like 90 percent of the time right you know you 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 just keep going because you're just like oh man you get you keep going you'll get that it's that one sort of eureka moment where you're like yeah we got one yeah now that'll take care of the next you know 90 95 (laughs) percent of the time when you don't see anything right Um, right I mean, you that's, what spend, the, that's what the cameras yeah. never catch, right? Like no. a shark, it's like, oh yeah, we caught a new one. Oh, we put a trawl down. We got another one. Oh, we got right. And you're like, you know, hold on a second. And, and things they don't often like, they might mention it in passing or something. But like, right. you know, we're in, you know, I'll just use a reference to the show we just did. I mean, it was freaking cold out. You know, we're up at two thirty in the morning. Right. We're out fishing all day in the bay, and it's like, you know, it's, it's you know, and then you got the wind chill going. You're kind of like, I contrast it to some of the other programs where you got people running around there bathing suits, bikinis, whatever. And, and, you know, in the tropics and I'm like, but this is where I want to be where the sharks yeah. are. Yeah. And yeah, you know, any, and like I tell you, anybody go diving, you know, tiger sharks, white sharks, anybody go down and do that in the tropics. But like we're in some freaking freezing place in, you know, Tokyo <laughs> Bay in the middle of winter time. It's cold as heck. And I'm yeah. kind of like, you got to, I don't think people watch that really get it. Like it's freaking cold out here. Oh, um, sure. And there's other times you'll be at like a, you know, I did another program in Taiwan in the summertime at the fish markets, which is a great place I like to go. And it's, it's you know, it's like 100% humidity, hot as heck, and it stinks. There's rotting fish. It's just, and you, again, you try to, like, people don't realize it kind of really smells here. And you're some place that they don't really don't, you know, speak English for the most part. But you get by, you figure it out. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to used to joke around you could drop me in some village in outer Mongolia and give me a week and I'll be friends with all the village elders there 
Um, you know, it. you got to kind of have that be a bit fearless in terms of just yeah. like, sure, I'll go do that. What the heck, you know? Yeah. So that, you know, it's not even like they're speaking a language I'd be familiar with, you know? Right. Um, so, so it's, but just, I think it's, it's showing that it's showing that you're willing to, to connect with them. Right. Yeah. That, that's where you gain, where you gain trust from mm -hmm. someone who doesn't know you is you're right. To try their culture. You're willing to, to take part in that. And I think that goes to your skill set and your, your need to sort of explore the world and explore different cultures that, that, that helps you in your right. job. Right. Absolutely. If you're not, you have to be prepared to do that because it's not going to be the pleasant, you know, it's like, you know, it's not always going to be the most pleasant place to be. Um, of course, when you're younger, it's a little easier. You're more happy to do because you're really exploring. Now you like, like, I can think I can like stay there, here, there. But you know, there's still a lot of places that are just they're out of the way. But that's where you need to go to. But it's it's right. kind of fun because after the trip, it's great to like, God, that was really a cool trip. Yeah, okay, yeah. it stunk. Yeah, there was crocodiles in the river. Yeah, there was whatever. But you're just kind of like, that was really cool. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and that, those are kind of, and that just kind of motivates me for like the next experience, the next journey. Oh yeah. No, I would imagine that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about after a species gets named. Mm -hmm. Um, there are sometimes, I don't know how often this would happen, but there are sometimes because you've just seen a species, you don't know their population size. You don't know uh, a lot of things about them because you've just discovered them. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the species get listed on say like the IUCN red list, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of like an international list of, of endangered species at different levels, depending on, you know, what their population size is or their information is. Right. How does that, how do you go from, from discovering a new species and then listing? Does that happen often because there's not much information about them? Yeah. A lot of the things, this is why it's really important. Why I've been one of the reasons I got really involved with that is that, uh, you know, you want to make sure if you're going to go to the trouble of like assessing a species, it's conservation, or even it's, you know, in some cases, fisheries status, you got to know, first of all, what the name of the species is. And that's what early in my career, I'd be out, you know, on some of these uh, trawlers and you'd be catching these, you know, uh, sharks or rays and stuff. And they didn't even know what the names of these things were. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to have a name so you know what you're talking about. And that even used to go on even here, but now they're getting better about identifying skates and some of these lesser known species, uh, but two species, whereas it was just like collectively called, oh, uh, sharks or skates. Now they're actually looking at them because each one has a unique life history to it. Right. So, so when you, when you find these things and you go through and you look at their, what their, their life, you know, a lot of times with the newer species, a lot of times you don't know much about them. Some, there are exceptions, but sometimes you don't know much about them. And so we do these, they do these, uh, red list assessment. So you have a sense of like, as a species, is it, you know, is it uh, data deficient? Is it a least concern or near threatened or all the way up to something to say like critically endangered. And, uh, and you know, I did, a, I was a co-author in a paper a couple of years ago, kind of assessing this and no surprise to me, like uh, the rays are actually the group that there's really not a lot known about them because people tend to overlook those things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then, um, you know, and then a lot and almost half the species are data deficient. Um, and about, and then in front about a quarter of them are like, you know, kind of, you know, near threatened or higher or, vul or vulnerable. And people tend to think of things like you'll think like a white shark or mako sharks or mm -hmm. something like that, which those, those are actually pretty well protected species. Yeah. And I know, and the other ones, you know, basking sharks, which I know we'll talk a little bit about more in a moment, but they, you know, so it gets back to this whole lost sharks thing, but there's these other species that sometimes people don't even know they're fishing or they're even being taken. And, and, and I can tell you from going to like villages, uh, places and parts of the world where 30 years ago, I would see them catching a lot of these coastal species that maybe occur less than, you know, two or 300 feet deep. And now they're fishing a thousand feet, two thousand feet deep because they're not catching them inshore. And they're catching mm -hmm. completely different species. And so, by assessing these things through the IUCN, through the red listing process, you could at least you have a reference to go to, like what's known about this. And, and a lot right. of those things are fairly informative. Um, and a lot of the species, again, like white sharks, you know, at this point they're fairly well protected, and certainly in most of the Western or developed countries, they're mm -hmm. fairly well protected. And I kind of tell people like. Yeah, they're high profile, but you know I'm not worried about them at this point in time, really, because they're yeah. they're they're iconic. You're not going to miss what they are. Yeah. But there's other species that are like you know there's species in the Western Indian Ocean, for example. We have there's one I always refer to like as in a good example called the honeycomb cat shark, 
-hmm. We haven't seen this thing in the wild since 1972. And the species wasn't even formally named until 2006. Wow. So we have a species that we haven't even seen in, you know, 45 years that we don't even know if it's still around. It didn't even have a name till a few years ago. So that's why it comes back to like kind of the lost sharks and put, get names of these things. Like you, you almost, you can't do it fast enough. And it's surprising how little interest there really is outside the field to support this type of research because you got things that are disappearing. You hear people talk about it. On the one hand, you got things that we're not even seeing anymore, but nobody's bothering to, you know, outside, you know, my group, nobody's really bothering to go look for these things and see if they're, they may be plentiful. We just don't know. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so that's why I try to put an emphasis on that. You know, conversely, 20% of all the sharks known in the world today have only been discovered and named over the last 10, 15 years. Hmm. And it's really been a small group of us, uh, myself and some colleagues in, um, in Australia that have really been uh, pushing this, trying to, trying to work out and name these things. And because uh, again, you're trying to assess things that don't even have a name or they have an improper name. And uh, you know, at least once you kind of get it, even if you have it's uh, you know, data deficient or something that's a, a least concerned or near threat, at least you have a baseline, something to work from right. and you know what to look for. Well, and, and it also uh, informs other people. Right. Mm -hmm. Like so for someone like myself, when somebody mentions, say, like, like what happened a couple of weeks ago, somebody mentioned basking sharks. It, it made me look on the Endangered Species Act in the States to find out where they're listed, if they're listed. And, mm -hmm. and then you get you get a profile of information. So it sort of forces people to say, we don't have a lot of information, but this is what we do know. And it gives people an idea of, you know, the status of where they are, if it's data deficient or not. But you, mm -hmm. you kind of have a little bit of a history of of that species. Right, right. And, and, you know, that's a, that's a great example here, you know, with, when this came up for a few years ago about whether they should be endangered or listed as a species of concern. Um, you know, I was one of the experts they brought in to talk about it. And I was more pushing for the species of concern just because it's one of these things that nobody's really bothered to look for. We know at times, and again, I grew up here in Monterey, so there's times you'll see them out in the bay, they'll be fairly common. Other times you might go a while without seeing them. But mm -hmm. again, talking to fishermen and stuff, or even these whale watching boats, they'll, they'll say, "Oh yeah, we see them." And so one of the things that is, one of the things we started was what's called we call it our spot a basking shark project, and it's kind of a tri-national thing because I work with my uh, colleagues in Canada on the Pacific coast, and then with uh, colleagues in Baja, and and especially with today's modern technology, we try to get the word out to people, and hopefully people listen to the show. Well, especially if you're in California or on the west coast yeah, we here, have a lot of California listeners. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, contact us at the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, our spot of asking shark program, because, and take a picture, and people, when we kind of started putting out the word, we got a, quite a few people sending us pictures, sending us locations, and as I kind of suspected, they're not that uncommon. I'm not going to say they're as common as they were. You know, we really don't know because we didn't have any baseline information before, but now with people taking pictures of them on their phone and can send us an image, we're building up a database now yeah. and we're kind of, we're kind of seeing there's trends now where we see at times of the year, they'll start to show up more commonly than at others. Right. And That's so true. it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's really kind of good now to start getting some information on how commonly these things occur here or are they uncommon. And we just sort of see this little bit of an up and down yeah. uh, pattern with them. But again, we're starting to get some information on them. I, I, one of the things I try to avoid is that, yeah, everybody likes to rush to list things as endangered or near extinction and stuff. But, you know, you start listing everything as that. It just sort of gets washed over and you start, it's like you get the roll of the eyes, like, yeah, everything's going extinct. Well, right. and in some cases, like, you know, off California, you know, I, I've been, we've been out here in the Bay here, been looking at the, the white shark population out here. I go up, I've been doing these overflights with helicopters here. I can yeah. go up here and I can see 30, 40 white sharks within an hour. Yeah, and they've been right here. a lot this year. Yeah. We were really noticing them. And right. And the, the interesting thing here that I've been on to is that you can, and, and some of my colleagues, that we're seeing the small ones, the, the newborns right. up here, which is new. Yeah. And so you, is that like just a thing because the, the water's been warm through El Nino the last couple of years, or is, this a, or is this a habitat expansion? Because Southern California, they've been well known for decades that they're, the small ones are very common off some of the beaches down there. But this is – 
you know, we've seen them you know, over the, I think back growing up here, there have been sort of years where you, you're kind of more associated with El Nino where some little white sharks might be incidentally caught. And you're like, you know, oh, okay, how oh, big deal. You didn't really think to take note of it. But now we pay attention to it because white sharks are on people's radar. And yeah. so we see these things. And, and again, I can go up there and I can see a whole bunch of white sharks literally and it's ironic because I see them, they're right off these populated beaches people are swimming at, people are surfing and stuff. And if you kind of grew up here, you're just sort of like, that's just one of the things. You go for a walk in the woods, you might see a bear, you might see a mountain lion. You go in the ocean, you might see a shark. I see a shark, absolutely. And so you just think, you know, people coming from out of the area, though, it's a little different. Um, yeah. Because they're not familiar with it. But, um, but again, you got things like white sharks. I'm not that worried about them because they're, I think the population's increased probably due to probably the Marine Mammal Protection Act because we're protecting their food. And then, you know, the, some of the laws they passed in the early 90s for white shark protection was certainly certainly helped, but I'd probably attribute as much or more to the Marine Mammal Protection Act because mm -hmm. if there's more food here, they're going to be here. So. Yeah, and I remember I, I did an interview with uh, 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 Dr. Chris Lowe mm -hmm. uh, from Long Beach. Actually. Yep. And, a good friend of mine. Yep. Yeah, and he 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 said the exact same thing. He says the California population of white sharks have been increasing, and it's probably due to the fact that there are more sea lions around, and mm -hmm. and and it's because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act that's allowed their food to grow and and to the population to e expand, and that's yep. what that's where these these guys are are growing from. So, which is great. I mean, that's that's yep. part of the protection. It's not a direct protection always on uh, for a specific species, but. It's indirect through the food. Right. It was, it was an unintended consequence in a yeah. good way. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is interesting because, you know, I love, I love the fact that you have like the spot of a basking shark project because it's a great, I love, I'm a, we're he, we here at, at Speaker Flu are huge fans of, of citizen science projects where we get people who are uh, involved because a lot of people will become citizen scientists uh, almost to a full time basis looking for these sharks that's something yeah they like to do like people like to geocache so that hey i'm going to go out on a boat i have a boat i'm going to go out and i'm going to look for basking sharks and and take a photo of it and send it uh you know right. to this group and, and see if they can you know yeah. they can make it, something with it it's a great it, way of, of collecting information it, yeah it's a, also a way of kind of connecting with the with the public and stuff and yeah if i get a quick plug we actually have another program called uh it's hammer time which one of my other students Love nikki it. vasquez is doing Love with hat looking for hammerhead sharks in Southern California. And the if I could just mention that, the Absolutely. interesting thing that with the, we, the, the, the smooth hammerhead sharks actually are not that uncommon. They actually are one of the more temperate water hammerhead shark species. And those are not that uncommon to see. What's, what is more interesting is, is if you get scalloped hammerheads, which are more of a warm, warm right. subtropical species. And so if you get it up, if, if you're in Southern California, you see a hammerhead, if you can get a picture, particularly with the hammer, we can tell, identify it. And so what Vicky's trying to do is determine if they're smooth or scalloped hammerhead sharks because, it's, well, their hammerheads are kind of cool to see. Absolutely. Um, and, but they're very distinctive, obviously. But we're trying to see which, which species, you know, if there's been any change in terms, do you see are the scalps more common here now than they used to be? Right. Now, is this, uh, would this be like for, for citizen scientists to do this? Uh, would this be mostly like I can understand for the basking sharks, you can probably see it from a boat because they tend to mm -hmm. kind of stay to the surface. But with with uh, hammerheads, they tend to be a little deeper. Would this be from uh, uh, from divers? Is that is that where you? Uh, it could be. Di it could be dive. We've had we get stuff from divers. Fish actually fishermen a lot of times because even if you're on like a out fishing or even just a private or or a, a recreational boat stuff, you know sharks sometimes come around if you're catching fish. Right. And so there, and it's more sort of. You know, basking sharks are kind of hard to miss if you happen to encounter yeah. one. Hammerhead sharks, if you see them, you're like, wow, I saw a hammerhead. Um, you know, but you never know what species it is. It, you know, they're just sort of haphazard. They just sort of like, I always tell people like, you know, if, if I go out looking for sharks, a lot of times I don't always find them. It's when I'm not looking for them, <laughs> I'll find them. That's all and, uh, yeah. Which is actually happens quite a bit. And with the hammerhead sharks, again, if you've got, you know, what do you have, like, you know, couple million people maybe out at the beach or in the ocean in Southern California during, during this time of year, the chances of someone encountering one are, are much higher right. uh, versus if, you know, if I'm, if we're just out by ourselves on a boat driving around Southern California by trying to see them, our chances are not so good. You know, we may encounter them, we may not, but when you got like 2 million eyes looking for you versus, yeah. you know, a half a dozen, your chances go way up and that's for sure gets into the whole like the citizen science uh, yeah. 
angle and stuff. In fact, I, another quick little story here. A couple years ago, about two years ago now, we discovered a, it's a known species of shark. It's called a velvet dog shark, uh, mm-hmm. which was caught off Southern California off Long Beach. It's a smaller shark. It only gets maybe two, three feet. This is a shark that's known from Hawaii. It's, been, it's fairly common out there, but we, it was unknown from the Eastern Pacific. And we got one, it came up off Southern California, which, you know, I found out like that they, cause somebody, some a fishery observer saw it and thought it was pretty sure it was not, you know, it wasn't what they were initially identified it for as a cat shark, saved right. it. And this guy had had some familiarity with the, with the species in Hawaii. And it turned out we added a new species to, to the California record. And this species is kind of, again, sort of usually more of a warmer, warm tempered species. Well, a, about a month ago, uh, through this uh, website, iNaturalist, um, a colleague of mine saw this picture posted from Crescent City of, a, of what he thought was, looked like a velvet dog shark. And so he put me in touch with the marine biologist up there. Uh, they, they think this washed up at the Kellogg Ranch or somewhere up there. Turns out it's a velvet dog shark. It's the second record from the Eastern wow. Pacific, second one from California. But this thing's like more of a warm water thing, and it's up. They got it off Crescent City. Do you think that's a, that's a climate change consequence, just with what's who, been going on over the past three years? You know, it, it could be. I it it, it it's it. Uh, you know, it had me a bit uh, flummoxed. Let's say. Right. Um, yeah. it, it's you know I don't like to jump the gun and stuff, but no, no, of course, of course. suddenly certainly some was going going on. This this thing was up here, and then I kind of wonder like I wonder if some of the fishermen catch these things and they just throw them back because they just think it's some little little goofy shark and they don't you know look at it but now i've kind of got this thing on my radar you know if you'd have brought some more in off southern california i thought yeah it's that's not an atypical but the right. fact you get them all you know and your listeners are not familiar it's you know northern california is fairly cool temperate water you're not likely to be bathing without a wetsuit on and right it's not really something you're out at the beach you know yeah, so yeah. it's fairly cool and uh, so that's so i'm kind of excited I don't know, i'll see where that goes i you know it's kind of one of those stay tuned projects well, I mean, yeah, and that's that's what the that's what the fascinating thing is too is when you when you receive this type of news and you're like, wait, hold on a second, like, right, this is this is all this all this kind of stuff, and and it's all because of citizen scientists like like uh, and programs like iNaturalist that post these that where people can post these species, yeah, yeah it, what they are and, and whatnot. I think that's a great great kind of thing to do. Yeah, and it's that's what it gets back to having all these camera phones and everything. If, otherwise, somebody would have been trying to describe this to me, and I'd have thought, this can't be one of these. Oh, yeah. You know, well, must even be. like, uh, do you know Michael Bear? Have you? Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he's got he's got a, a, a seven gill uh, program where mm-hmm. he's, when he when I interviewed him, he was mentioning the fact that you know the fact that that GoPros people could take GoPros underwater and take pictures of these of these sharks, and mm-hmm. actually now they've they've figured out that they can identify the individuals based on their patterns along their just before their gills, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're trying to use uh, a program that that uh, was designed to identify unique whale sharks based mm-hmm. on their spots to identify individuals to find out residency time if they get spotted over and over again in the same. I guess they're 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 more in the La Jolla area, but right. I think it's you know this is this type of technology allows for more and more discovery of of different species and so forth uh, underwater mm-hmm. and above water which i think uh will, will help the cause and and to, and to just to go on about citizen scientists um here at speaker for blue we're, we're developing a program that will is, is basically a, a program that is a is going to be a resource for citizen scientists so mm-hmm. people who want to become citizen scientists or are citizen scientists and, and take part in programs well, it'll be basically a, a free site that people can come to and they can uh, provide information on experiences with different programs and what they're doing. And we're going to get bring people who uh, like program managers such as yourself who are looking after like spot a, a basking shark to make people aware of the different programs and describe the programs yeah. to citizen scientists to allow them to sort of inspire them to be like, oh, I want to try that. Or, hey, I'm in mm-hmm. the California area. Maybe I'll, I'll go out and take pictures and see if I can find a basking shark or so, yeah. you know, like that kind of stuff. And, and just to kind of, of just get more resources. Cause I find there's a lot of resources like where you can discover different programs and you mm-hmm. get like the text-based information on it, but you never hear it from the people who are, who are planning the programs or doing the programs, whether they liked it or not. Some of the challenges advice that, that, you know, they could provide other science, other citizen scientists that can actually go out and, and make sure that their experience is great when they do that. Right. One, one of the things about it is I know like whenever we promote it, 
And, you know, we we'll always get a bit of an uptick tick in people like sending us images and stuff, but it, it, mm -hmm. it could literally turn into like a full-time job. And I'm, oh, for sure. I'm usually juggling so many things that <laughs> come back around like, Oh yeah, let's go out and promote the thing again. And it will you know, maybe they do lo local news story on it or something. Again, there'll be a bit of a spike. So it is a, uh, but it, you know, having something that kind of keeps stuff in the public conscious out there, it's really sure. cool. Cause the chances are it's going to be somebody that's, that's going to see something really neat. It's going to be somebody that's, that's coming from like we call over the hill, like over in the valley or something that goes to the ocean a few times a year. They're the ones who are most likely to see stuff yeah. versus the yeah. people that are out there all the time. For that's sure. just the way it is. It's <laughs> just the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so. But yeah, yeah. I think it'd be, I think that'd be cool for, for Speak of Falu to help bring about awareness for these types of programs. Yeah. I think that'd be um, awesome. That'd yeah. be really good. Cool. So, well, this, this has been great. Honestly, we've got to talk about a lot of things and, and I'll, I'll be honest, I can probably talk all afternoon to you about <laughs> all your experiences in the field um, and, and, and discovering different sharks. Uh, I mean, this is your, your career has been amazing. It's been, it, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, and obviously I would love to invite you back. Uh, sure. To, again, to, to talk more about sharks and more about the programs that you're working on. Um, and I really appreciate you coming on because I know how busy you are with, with work and, and the shark week thing that went on and, yep. uh, and everything like that. And, and your parents are about to, to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. So planning for that, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, uh, to interview with us. It's, it's yep. been a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Andrew. It's really been fun and sure. I'm happy to come back anytime. It'd be great. Yeah, you bet. That'd be great. Just stay on the line and, and we'll sure. just talk after and, and sure. uh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So that was Dr. Dave Ebert. I told you it was a great interview. I hope you feel as inspired as I do after listening to that uh, and conducting that interview. I think that was, that was really, uh, he, he was really great in, in offering us everything, you know, and I think that's great. That's, that's what I love about, about people in this, industry when i talk to them my experiences with them uh, the people who have been on this show they just give everything they have and including their passion and sharing your passion is it's not an easy thing to do right it's it's it's, it's emotional right you you show your emotions you you're vulnerable for that little bit and and people are the people who've been on this podcast like dave uh chris parsons naomi rose ed hines you know nathan johnston lynn Moore said all of the people that have been on there's so many so many guests that we've had have just shared their their initiatives, their projects, their passions, and I think it's been I think it's phenomenal that they do this, and it's 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 really uh, it's really a lot of fun to be honest, and it's it's great to share it with you because then I find you guys get closer to these scientists and conservationists, right? You guys get to understand where they're coming from, their challenges, their successes, their frustrations, their happiness. We get to hear all of it through these interviews, and I think it's great. So. Um, and we're also blessed with having people back, which I hope we can ha get Dave back again. Yeah, he was pretty great uh, the first time, so I'm sure he's going to be even better the next time we, we do something. So uh, thank you very much, Dave, for that. If you guys have any questions, concerns, comments, you want to talk about the episode, you want to find out if there's a shark that you love that has been identified by Dave, you can do so by going to speakupforblue.com forward slash group to join our Speak Up For Blue community Facebook group. It's going to be awesome. All you have to do is use your Facebook account. When you go to that link, use your Facebook account. Click uh, request to join. I'll let you in as soon as I'm on Facebook, which is almost all the time. I'm a little bit addicted. But you're going to get in. We're going to, you're going to be included in the conversation, and I'm going to be happy to hear from you. So introduce yourself. Let me know what your favorite species is. It's going to be awesome. Also, before we go, don't forget to uh, visit our Patreon campaign, speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I still have to rework some of the things because we were on a different initiative before. We're on an initiative now to really just fund our mission. I want to fund our mission. All the other stuff, the sponsorships and everything like that is going to come at a different time. I want to fund our mission to get more citizen scientists involved, uh, interacting with pro different programs and just sharing information. That's what we do here. So uh, that'll be, I'm looking forward to that. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Uh, I just appreciate all the stuff you do. If you just go look at it, that'd be great. If you want to contribute even a dollar, that'd be great. $5, $10, whatever you want. There's just different incentives that will really help you, uh, help you out maybe to, uh, to get in on it. So uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. My name is Andrew Lewin. Have a happy Wednesday. Nathan Johnson, I believe, is back on this Friday. Have a great week. We'll see you on Friday. Happy conservation. <laughs>